So our attendees are joining now. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. I truly uh, hope that everyone is doing well today. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Mark Bishop, and I would like to welcome you to this talk uh, today titled uh, Virtual Rig Talk. Uh, this talk would be presented to us by the very uh, experienced uh, Mr. Neil Ramkelawan. So just a bit of information about Neil before we begin today. Uh, Neil is an oil and gas professional with 16 years of experience. Uh, Neil spent two and a half years in the uh, Petrotrin oil refinery at Point of Pier as a refinery operator. Uh, then he spent 12 years as a drilling engineer for BPTT. And currently, he is the planning and performance team lead for BP Houston. So before I invite Neil to begin his presentation, I would just like to remind uh, you all that if you do have any questions, you can either type them in the chat window or you could ask them at the end of your presentation. So with that being said, I would like to invite Neil to begin his presentation. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Mark, can, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm hearing you. I, I'm in. All right, good. All right, guys. Uh, sorry. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. So uh, this is only my second time ever doing one of these presentations. Uh, the first time was for um, some high school students um, for, for a STEM presentation. So um, it the presentation may be a little bit basic, but if you do have um, any questions, I mean, feel free to to, um, to ask. I, I really do encourage questions. Um, you know, uh, I mean, you could let me know if there are any questions, or like Mark said, type it into the um, into into the chat box. So um, I want to start off with a, a little a little more introduction. All right, um, so that people could understand who I am. Um, so. Uh, these are a couple of pictures that kind of describes, you know, who Neil Ramklawan is, right? Um, I am the eldest of three siblings, um, and my dad is a maxi taxi driver, and this is actually a, a photo of his maxi taxi. Actually, my, my first job was conducting a maxi taxi with him on weekends. Um, I've also worked in groceries. I was an AC technician at one point in time. Um, I mean, election, elections now finish. I actually worked uh, for elections as a polling agent. So uh, I've done a, a lot of various jobs in, in, in my life. Um, educational wise, um, I went to a small school called Irie High School, which is in Sparia. Um, after that, I went to San Fernando Technical Institute. So I have a diploma in mechanical engineering. Um, I mean, it doesn't exist anymore because it's part of the UTT, but um, that's where I went. Then I did a BSc in mechanical engineering at the University of the West Indies. Um, like Mark said, I've spent uh, two and a half, two and a half, 
years, really good years at the uh, Petrochemical Refinery. That's my first experience in the oil and gas industry. And that, um, it was a really good stepping stone for me. Um, I learned a lot of stuff, made, made a lot of good friends. And I still do have a lot of friends, um, you know, from, from that time there. Um, after that, I moved to BPTT, um, where I was a drilling engineer for 14 years. Um, I've worked on nearly all the different fields um, in BPTT, and I've drilled development wells, exploration wells, um, even some one or two high angle wells. And it's actually a shot of me here on um, on the last rig I, I, I worked on. Um, personally, I'm, I'm, I'm married um, and we don't have any kids, but we have three lovely dogs and it's actually a pity of our three lovely dogs. All are rescue dogs. So we believe in, um, you know, rehoming uh, dogs. And um, last, I'm a big football fan. I'm a big Arsenal fan. I could probably hear some groans happening right now, but um, but but yeah, I probably am a glutton for punishment. But big big football and Arsenal fan. So that's a, a quick introduction into um, into who who Neil Ram Kilawan is. All right. So what I'm gonna do, I'm actually gonna start with uh, with a video. Um, and this is generally about uh, drilling operations. Um, the video, I mean, I just found it on YouTube. It's a, it's a shell video actually. Um, and it shows the, you know, drilling in deep water operations, right? Something that Trinidad is now, you know, it's pre uh, is now actually getting, getting into. All right, so after, you know, I've gotten to the video, I'm gonna just go through different components of drilling. Right, um, you know, different types of rigs, casing, mud, bottom hole assemblies, etc. Uh, then I'll do a virtual tour of a land rig, and then we'll have um, have any questions at the end. All right, so moving on to the video. All right, and like I said, I just uh, found this on um, on YouTube, and it's actually pretty. It is a pretty good video to show the basics of um, of drilling operations. Drilling a safe, deep water well can take years of planning and preparation. After identifying potential oil and natural gas reservoirs beneath the seafloor using seismic technology, a drill site is selected. Shell geoscientists choose the drill site location on the seafloor based upon the safest well path that will encounter the targeted oil and natural gas. For an exploratory well, in water depths up to 9,000 feet deep, this seafloor location is generally directly above the reservoir. A drilling rig is required to drill a well. In deep water, the rig may be on one of three vessels, a drill ship, a semi-submersible vessel, or it may be part of a floating production form. All rigs have a hoisting system to raise and lower the drill pipe and tools needed to drill the well, a blowout preventer or BOP stack, and a pumping system to circulate fluids in and out of the well while drilling. It's time to drill the hole or well bore using a drill bit. This initial step is called sputting in the well. The shallow sediments just below the seafloor are often very soft and loose. To keep the well from caving in and carry the weight of the wellhead, a large diameter base pipe or casing is drilled or jetted into place. The base pipe is assembled at the rig floor and a drill bit connected to a drill pipe is run through the inside to the bottom of the casing. The entire assembly is lowered to the sea floor by the rig hoist. At the sea floor, the driller spuds the assembly into the sea floor sediments, then turns on the pump. Water or a drill fluid is used to jet the pipe into place until the wellhead is just above the sea floor. With the base pipe and wellhead at the right depth, the driller will release the bit and drill string from the jet pipe and drill ahead. While the well bore is being drilled, mud is pumped from the surface down through the inside of the drill pipe. The mud passes through the jets in the drill bit and travels back to the sea floor through the space between the drill bit and the walls of the hole. Drilling mud is used to, one, lift rock cuttings from the hole, two, keep the drill bit cool and lubricated, and three, fill the well bore with fluid to equalize pressure and prevent water or other fluids in underground formations 
from flowing into the wellbore during drilling. The mud is an environmentally friendly water-based mixture of clay for thickness and fine ground rock or barite for weight. At the planned depth, the driller will stop drilling and pull the bit out of the hole. A smaller pipe or casing string is then screwed together, connected to the drill pipe and run down to the sea floor and into the well. To permanently secure the casing in place, cement followed by mud is then pumped down the inside of the drill pipe. To separate the cement from the mud, a cementing plug is used. The plug is pushed by the mud to ensure the cement is placed outside of the casing, filling the annular space between the casing and the open hole wall. On some locations, a second surface casing is needed, thus the well is drilled even deeper. In this second surface casing interval, the well is cemented using a second smaller casing string, repeating the same process used in the last hole section. At this point in the well, the pressure in the deeper rock may be too high to continue with the simple water-based clay mud, or there may be the potential to encounter oil or gas. Before drilling below this point, a blowout preventer with a riser will be installed at the sea floor. The BOP stack is a massive system of valves and rams that protect the rig and environment from oil and gas flows should the weight of the drilling mud be too low. The BOP stack is connected to a pipe called a riser. The riser connects the rig to the well and allows us to circulate the drilling fluid and rock cuttings all the way back to the rig on the surface. The BOP stack is fully tested before we drill further. Drilling now resumes with the drill bit and drill pipe always operating through the BOP stack. Just as we did further up the hole, casing strings are run and cemented in place when needed to cover up the open hole sections. When the oil and gas zones targeted by the geologists are reached and the presence of an oil or gas zone is proven, a final casing string may be installed if the seafloor location is favorable for future development. This final casing string allows for the future safe production of the oil and natural gas. Okay. All right. So, um, so like I said, that was uh, basically what a deep water, uh, typical deep water drilling operations look like. Um, Typically in Trinidad, you would have land drilling, right? Um, then you would have uh, drilling uh, on both the east and the west coast, predominantly on the east coast. Um, we don't, at this point in time, we don't utilize uh, much uh, semi subs or drill ships. Um, we utilize jack up type rigs. Um, and I'll get into the, um, the different type of rigs and, and why we utilize those, um, those type of rigs. Okay. So just moving on to drilling engineering and what's it actually all about. All right, so typically um, I, I, when I got into drilling engineering, I, I wasn't actually sure what, uh, what the job scope entailed. Um, but basically uh, drilling engineers, we uh, safely design and execute the most cost-effective plan um, for the placement of wells and reservoir. Like uh, like the video said, we work closely with um, with with geologists because uh, based on their interpretation of seismic information, they kind of help us. Well, they actually tell us exactly where uh, where they believe the hydrocarbons are, be it oil or gas, and then it's our um, our job to design our well to access um, to access those those reserves of those, hydro, those hydrocarbon reserves. Um, things we look at are rig requirements, uh, well trajectory. We look at the drill string design. Sorry about that. Um, mud design, casing design, and cement and design. So these are the, the, the big areas that uh, that drilling engineers look at. Um, so getting into into rigs, right? Um, so like I said, predominantly in Trinidad, we have land land drilling. Uh, we do have some some platform drilling. Um, so you know platforms. I mean, I've I've realized that there there is some. Um, confusion between a platform and a rig, right? Um, so 
I actually said, let me put a, a picture of a platform. So platforms have a fixed structure. Um, uh, and this is typically one that we'd see on the East Coast. Uh, basically, you drill wells through these, um, and it's the when the hydrant comes up, it's the first um, location where you have some amount of um, cleaning up of the hydrocarbons occurring before you pipe it um, to onshore or for, to whatever facility. So just to ensure that um, so everybody's you know aware of what the platform looks like. Um, so Jacobs, I've spent predominantly a lot of time on Jacobs. Um, and these um, are dependent on the water depth. Your limitation on jackups are the, uh, the length of the legs that jack into the sea. Um, Semi-sub and drill strips, uh, those are for, for deeper deeper water. Um, so like right now in the GOM, we predominantly have, GOM is GOM, GOM for Mexico, we predominantly have drill strips and they can operate in about 6,000, 7,000 feet of water. All right, um, BBTT is actually bringing in a rig soon. It's called the Mills Discoverer. It's going to be a semi sub, and that's actually going to be for the Matapal uh, program that's going to start October, November this year. Um, this is one that you'll also see in, 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 in deep water. I, I believe, I strongly believe, and I, I may be um, you know, wrong or subject to correction that um, this is kind of setup that. Um, Guyana may have where they will have something called a FPS, so a floating production and offloading. So the jelly wells and these are coming and, um, and, and, and take uh, whatever hydrocarbons there is. So generally, this is what the, the, the major types of, uh, of rig that are in the industry right now. Um, getting into the jack-up type rigs, um, this is actually a, a, a jack-up that I've worked on and you'd see it being over a platform so you could see different sizes. These are towed on location, so they're hooked up to, um, to boats and they're towed um, to the whatever location they need to, to get into. All right, and the last type of rig I'm gonna show here, this is actually a photo of the most discoverer that will be in Trinidad soon uh, to start operations for BPTT. For anyone who goes down Chagarama, so down the islands, if you look um, on the horizon, you're gonna see a lot of rigs are actually stacked. Um, stacked there, you'd see a variety of, uh, of these types of rigs, um, as well as uh, jackups and um, drill chips that are currently there waiting for, um, you know, waiting for work. Okay, um, are, there, are there any questions right now? Anyone has any questions before I move on? Okay. Sorry. Um, Neil, I see the two hands raised. All right, um, let me see if I could see that. Um, no, I'm not seeing it right now. So um, whoever has their hand raised, feel free to come out of mute and, and go ahead and ask. Uh, we would also encourage, if you don't want to do that, to type your question in the Q&A, and, and we and Neil will be able to see the question. So, Alexandra, can you? Um, I mean, if people have questions and they write it, I mean, I can't see it right now. Can you? Um, can you go ahead and read it out? Sure. Um, I'm only seeing one question right now in the chat. Yeah. And they, asked, okay. they asked, what is the name of the rig we are exploring today? Um, <laughs> so I'm unsure. Uh, I do know it's a well services rig that we'll be showing um, and it's a, a land rig. Um, as to the actual name of it, I'm, I'm, I'm unsure right now. All right, so we've kind of touched on rigs. So I'm gonna now move on to well trajectory, right? So once um, the geologists have identified where the hydrocarbons are, uh, we then de de design a well part um, to help us you know, access that reserves. Um, so the well trajectory is simply the directional plan of the well. In the video that you saw, um, you have seen that they drill straight down. Sometimes it's uh, not possible to actually drill a well straight down and you actually do drill wells uh, that have a directional profile. Some of the reasons that you would do that, um, you have sometimes on the rig floor, you have what you, sorry, on the sea, seabed, you have what you call shallow gas. Uh, these are potential high pressure, um, high pressure, 
uh, sands that do have hydrocarbons. So if you do drill into that, there may be um, a risk of a, of a safety event happening. So it's sometimes it's impossible just to come right over where your reservoirs are and drill straight down. Um, so a typical example of a trajectory, it would look like this here, right? This is, um, if you see, it's, a, it's called an S-type well. There's also what you call J-type wells. There's what you call horizontal wells. So horizontal wells, predominant, predominantly, they are, as the name indicates, horizontal to, um, before you reach your, 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 your sons. Um, so you use... Um, when, when designing these, these wells part, you try to keep it as, as simple as possible. Um, like I said, if you could have drilled straight down, that would be ideal, but you can't, right? So um, you have different sections of your well part, like a kickoff point, a build up section, you have tangent sections, but ultimately the intent is to develop a, the simplest type well part to safely access your, um, your hydrocarbons. Um, I know that uh, the majority of folks here, they are um, recent graduates, right? So um, they would be able to understand, you know, while drilling, we do acquire logs. So logs like me, logs in my mind is like, if you're driving on, on, on the highway, you're driving um, it, and you, you know, you're looking for science to figure out where you're going. Um, so we have tools in what you call our drilling assembly um, that kind of helps us determine if we are in sand formation, shale formation, what type of fluids are being drilled, is it water, is it hydrocarbon, and then there are actually tools that helps um, understand what's the volume of hydrocarbons that there are. So you'd have typical uh, gamma, gamma ray logs, resist resistivity logs, um, density logs and, 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 and density neutron logs, right? So those are the most popular that you would find um, that, are, that are run um, when, when drilling. All right, uh, just to give people an idea that, um, you know, if you put down like say a, a platform like I, I showed before, you are able to come over the platform and drill, drill, through, uh, drill through the platform um, to drill your wells, right? Um, you do have where you drill multi wells from from one location, um, and this is actually a typical uh, you know view of what those um, types of uh, multi well programs look like. So you may have like one platform here, another platform here, um, and 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 all these here are, are, are wells that are trying to um, to, to access reserves. This I'm trying to see this one here. This one. This is like a typical what a, a horizontal type well would look like these year, where they are um, they are more or less at uh, at ninety degrees for the uh, majority of the um, of the drilling operations. All right, so just going back. So that's what um, directional plans and well trajectories look like. Okay, so once you've figured out, you know, where or, you know, how you're gonna, um, you know, the trajectory of your well, you don't want to have a look at, um, at, your, at your drill string, right? So your drill string is the actual tool that you utilize um, to, 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 to drill formations. Um, typical uh, components of your drill string or what we call your bottom hole assembly, BHA, uh, you would have bits, um, you'd have MWD, LWD logs. These stands for measurement while drilling or logging while drilling. Then you'd have uh, different components uh, like drill colors, heavyweight drill pipe, um, and, and you know that makes up the rest of your, your, your drilling assembly. Um, a key thing to note is that all these things are screwed together. So um, you know when when designing your your bottom hole assembly, um, you know it's always good to understand what connections you have because different connections have different um, strengths. Um, so you need to ensure that while drilling, um, you know your components that are screwed together doesn't unscrew. All right. Um, so bits the one that was shown in the video was predominantly this a roller cone type bit, um, and there are basically two types of bit that you know that we use um, in the industry: roller cones and PDC. PDC stands for polycrystalline diamond compact. All right, um, this one operates in a type of sharing 
um, action. So it actually shares the formation while while drilling. Um, this one, roller cone, or it's also known as a rock bit. It, um, it, it crushes the, the formation. These are predominantly used for harder type formations, um, and these are, are used for, for softer type formations. All right, so drilling, drilling tools, all right. Um, so this is typically what a BHA would, would look like. And when I say BHA, which has a different components that, um, that, uh, no, that uh, provides you your logs, all right. So you'd have typically your bit, either a roller cone bit or a PDC, and then you'd have your MWD tools here. Um, like I said, uh, there are different, um, different sensors in your MWD tools, gamma ray res resistivity that, you know, kind of, that, that helps you understand what formation you're drilling. Um, what, what's interesting is all of this is actually uh, powered. So you do have um, uh, a turbine um, in, your, uh, in your MWD tools, right? So basically you pump mud while drilling. That mud, that mud turns your turbine. So it actually kind of works like a, a, a alternator uh, type system where it generates power to power all the tools that are down here. Um, and you do actually communicate uh, through to the tools and the most, uh, the most um, predominantly used means is uh, through mud pulse, right? Uh, basically you send pulses to the different tools here and they're able to decode that. Um, recently there has been new breakthrough where the drill pipe that you use is actually wired. So you do have um, like a, a, a wired component in the drill pipe. And when it screws together, you make like a full, uh, a full string of wire. Um, and it's the same thing like if you have a speaker or if you have electricity, right? And it, 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 um, it's able to uh, transmit information um, to, to your BHA. So that's something that's, that's new. Um, a couple of years ago, we did use wired pipe. We call it IntelliPipe. Um, but it was the first prototype and there were a couple of bugs in the system. I do know that they have uh, gone back and they are redesigning it. And um, I think it should be out, if, not, if, if it's not out already, that's being used in the industry. Um, the reason, one of the benefits of, of you know, having wired type pipe uh, combined with your MWD, the quality of data is a lot, um, is a, is a, is a lot, uh, is a lot better. All right, and that's what your drilling tools look like. And the last one is around your drill pipe. Um, so typically, this is what your drill pipe looks like. Like I said, we are evolving and they, they do have um, new pipe, uh, specifically in telepipe. Your drill pipe range in different sizes. You, you could have from three and a half to four and a half. The most common type I've ever used is five and seven meters. Um, this is actually what, you know, drill pipe looking up in the direct looks like. Um, typically you drill in stands, right? So a drill pipe, one length of drill pipe is 30 feet. A stand could be anywhere between three, uh, three singles um, screwed together or sometimes four. Um, the last thing I wanna highlight here is that in your bottom hole assembly, you have what you call drill colors. So drill colors, uh, they serve different purposes. Um, one of it is to actually add a little bit of weight for your drill assembly because if you are on surface and you're drilling, um, say, 15, 20,000 feet, you need to at least have some amount of weight um, at at your bit, close to your bit, to help uh, to help you know get that formation out. Another um, key thing about drill collars is that if you look at it here, these are spiral drill collars. Um, these actually help you and prevent you from um, from getting stuck, all right? And it's simple. Uh, if you think about, um, if you, you know, for anybody who goes off-roading, if you have smooth tires and you're in, a, in, in, in mud, you're gonna spin right here as opposed to if you have tires with treads, it's gonna help you, um, help you become unstuck. Okay. Um, Alexandra, are there any questions right now? Um, I feel like I've been talking and, you know, I'd like to entertain some questions. Um, just one question I saw. Mm -hmm. um, they asked, would the different rig types use if there's any difference other than the depth? Um, so, so yes, there are differences uh, based on the on the size of the rig. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, 
the, the top drive, um, and that's what, uh, what was shown in the video, you have different sizes of top drives. So the bigger rigs would have um, bigger top drives. Um, basically, that's the, that, you know, I, 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 I like to think about it, you know, that's what, what, what helps you drill. That's what provides the power. So uh, bigger rigs, definitely they're used for deeper wells. So they have bigger top drive systems. Um, Simple things like accommodation. Uh, I mean, the bigger rigs would hold more people. Mud pumps. Um, you would have um, a lot more mud pumps in um, in, in in the bigger type rigs. Um, so when you're when you're specking a rig, you'll need to understand, you know, the conditions and the different forces and pressures, etc., that you you're gonna encounter. So that helps you understand what size rig you you would need to, um, to have to achieve some of the depths that you would be um, looking to get to. Okay. All right. Um, so moving on to to mud, right? And you would have seen again in the video where, whenever we're drilling, we um, we do pump a fluid through the drill pipe that exits the bit and comes up on the on the annulus. Um, The, 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 word, the name mud actually came came up because uh, years ago when they now started drilling, they actually did use um, like dirt and water and hence the name mud, mud stock, right? So a couple of different functions for mud, um, they definitely remove cuttings from your hole because imagine if you're, if, you're, if you're drilling and you know, you don't want whatever you're taking out to fall back on you, that's, that's gonna be an issue. So you need to, you know, get that out of the hole. Um, so it cleans the bottom of the hole below the bed. Uh, it prevents flow of formation fluids. So um, basically you would have a hydro hydrostatic column of mud. Um, and I mean, basic physics principles and pressure principles, uh, P is equal to H or G, right? So your, your, your height of column would provide a hydrostatic pressure um, because as you drill, um, you do have uh, formation fluids, be it uh, hydrocarbons or water that do exert some amount of pressure. And you don't want your pressure of your formation being more than your hydrostatic column because then you're gonna have what you call um, a kick coming up to surface. Um, if that happens, um, and you would have seen in the video, that's when you have uh, the blood preventer comes into play and thereby you are able to, to shut in your well on the, um, on the blood preventer. Um, it controls torque, and when I say controls torque, it reduces friction. So you would have seen that there are basically two types of mud, um, water-based mud and oil-based mud. Um, so again, while drilling, there is some amount of lubricity that the mud provides to help reduce friction. Um, transmit MWD information. So we spoke about that, and that's about the pulsing um, that we use. And I, again, I like to think about it like binary. So it's a series of ones and zeros. Um, that you are able to decode on surface. Um, and definitely uh, another function is around cooling, um, cooling the bit, right? Because you the, the amount of heat that is generated sometimes, you need a medium to cool it. Um, yeah, basically this is what mud <laughs> looks like. Um, and one thing that wasn't highlighted, but whenever we do bring up um, cut-ins, um, the mud, it's in a closed system, right? Predominantly, well, the majority of the time it's in a closed system. So you definitely need to clean clean the mud system. Um, and you have what you call shakers. So basically uh, the mud flows over, over the shakers. It actually does what it says, it vibrates and it removes different cuttings. And you have different size shakers. You have the bigger ones that call scalpers that remove some of the bigger material. And then you have um, shakers which remove the smaller type material. Okay. All right, so getting into casing now. So the way I like to think about casing, it's like, um, it's basically big, big pipe, large diam diameter pipe. If you ever, ever see uh, like Wasa to the side of the road when they ever run water lines, you would see um, these big diameter pipes and that's what casing predominantly, predominantly are. Um, so there are different size of casing, and as you drill deeper, the intent is that you get smaller in size with casing. So you would start off what you would call a conductor. So it doesn't matter if you are uh, deep water or even shallow water, you, you, you either drive or you jet conductors, which is the biggest size. Uh, the reason for that is that that holds the wellhead. The wellhead is where you land off your different sizes of, of, of casing, right? 
so you do have uh, variant case and sizes. Um, predominantly, the typical sizes are um, like 36 inch, 30 inch, you have 20 inch, uh, 13 and 5 eighths, 11 and 3 quarter, 9 and 5 eighths. Those are, those are pretty standard sizes. Um, definitely when you are choosing and designing your, your casing, um, you need to look at the metallurgy. Um, so sometimes casing, they do have to operate in sour conditions, H2S conditions. So um, you don't want casing that will degrade over time. You need to understand what's the burst and collapse because these are pressure containment strings. Um, so you don't want you know, pressures while drilling or even if you do, uh, for whatever reason, take a kick, you don't want your, your casing uh, parting because of burst pressures. Um, you do screw together these, uh, these pipe and run in the hole. So again, you need to understand um, what's the tension rating and compression rating. Um, and you need to understand what's the strength of your connection types. Um, these are just a couple of pictures of what, uh, what it actually looks like. So this here is a typical conductor, all right? This is the biggest pipe that you would run. Um, this here, probably this looks like a smaller size pipe, probably lemon three quarter inch, and these are actually guys running running in in hole. Um, and this one here kind of shows the different um, the, the treads on on your um, on your connections. Okay, so all right, so I'm now seeing a couple of these questions here, right? So let me just come to the top here. Name of the rig. Right, different types. Okay. All right, in regards to BHA measurements, so I'm going to pull it to this side here. Um, to BHA measurements while drilling and logging, while drilling was mentioned. But what are some of the uh, methods for steering of drilling? So, all right, so the um, you have two. So you have different types of BHAs, right? You have a rotary BHA, which is basically you are rotating and drilling. Um, and then you have what you call rotary steerable BHAs. Um, these actually have a tool at the bottom of the BHA that helps, um, helps uh, orient while drilling. Um, the one that I am uh, familiar with, there is uh, what you call pads around around that tool. Um, it's an auto track system, it's, from, it's called auto track from Baker. And basically, while you're drilling, you um, you send pulses, and the pads kind of move up or down, and kind of pushes your pushes your BHA against the um, the well bore. So if I'm drilling, say I'm drilling straight down or even horizontally, if I want to turn, I would uh, send a, I would what you call downlink. So send communication, and a part would extend and push it. Um, in the direction that I would want to go. Um, there's different types of, uh, of um, measurements or sensors that you utilize to understand where you are. Um, you have what you call magnetometers, which uh, you utilize the magnetic field line of the earth to help understand your position. And you also use accelerometers, which um, also kind of helps you understand um, where you are when drilling. All right. All right. At the end, uh, Peter thoughts on drilling. So yeah, I could get back to that. Um, and then what kind of QQC can be done on conduct? Okay, okay. QQC can be done on conductors and um and connections. So basically, you do um. So before anything goes offshore, it has to go through a QQC plan, right? So definitely um, you do what you call VTI inspections. Um, so basically you're looking at the pipe body. Um, you also look at um, all the treads are washed and clean and you do have inspectors who come and inspect for pitting. So pitting is basically rust of the connections um, and that's a no-no. So, so basically um, those are the type of you know, QQC you do for conductors and connections. Um, also, dope which is more or less like grease um, you need to understand the type of grease that's applied on it you have what you call storage dope for um, connections and that's as the name implies you that that's what you need to have in um, in storage but when you take it offshore to run you actually do utilize what you call running dope so those are the type of things you look for in terms of uh, qqc for connections and, um, and conductors okay 
All right. Um, and just getting back to Grant, uh, I'll answer the question when it, when it comes to the to the end. All right. So the last thing I want to touch on here is um, a cement. So you would have seen again in the video where we utilize cement to um, to hold the casing in place. But actually, cement has um, it also has a valuable um, role in that it also keeps out any hydrocarbon um, that that may be you know that you would have drilled. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the explosion of the deep water horizon in the Gulf of Mexico, but when they looked at one of the uh, when they looked at the investigation, one of the contributing factors was that um, there was a poor cement job. So things like the compressive strength of the cement, the cement density, etc., they may not have been up to you know what was required. Um, so besides holding um, you know, holding case in place, it does provide a a valuable uh, role in the design of um, of, of of wells. Um, other things, you know, when when considering like cement uh, thickening time, uh, you do pump it in a viscous state, um, and you do want it to set up. Um, so you you do actually do a a lot of testing, a lot of design beforehand, um, be, you know, before you pump your cement. So you design it in the lab, you do all the tests in the lab, uh, then you send your cement offshore. And if you think about it, and, and if you want to know what cement looks like, it, it does look like your, your typical rock hard cement or TCL cement that you would get in the hardware um, with a couple more additives, definitely. Um, and before you actually pump that in the hole, you do take samples of it um, and send it. And you do take samples to send back to onshore to make sure that uh, what you're going to what you're pumping, you know, it's up to spec. Um, other things in terms of cement design, you need to accurately uh, calculate the cement volume um, because when you pump that down your well bore and it comes on the annulus, um, there's only a certain amount of volume that that annulus is going to take. You don't want to pump excess cement such that it comes all the way back up to your rig floor. That's that's on, that's on a good a good day. All right, so I'm gonna just take uh, one more question before I actually move on. So this is basically, um, you know, just a summary, a high level summary of, uh, of drilling engineers and, and, you know, what they do and what their roles and responsibilities are. Um, so let me just take this question here. When geo steering during horizontal well drilling, right, the LWT, LWD tools are located on top of the bit. So there will be a delay in data transmission. How can you accurate, how can you accurately, I'm gonna say no, right? When the reservoir is reached. So when geo steering. So geo steering is actually, um, I'm gonna say an art, all right? So in, the, in the oil field, there are very few uh, people who, um, you know, who can do it uh, fairly well. Um, you are right that um, when, when, when geo steering, um, you do get a delay in transmission. That's why geo steering is a very slow process. Um, prior to actual drilling, you do have a lot of models that are, that, that are built, right? So when you are drilling and you are getting the information, you can help match it up with the real-time information. Um, how can you accurately tell when your reservoir is reached? Again, it comes back to the different um, the different sensors that you do have. Um, so you'll be using your different directional tools to help understand where you are, but you'd use, you'll be using your gamma resistivity and your density neutron to help understand if you are in the reservoir or not, right? I hope that answered your question. Um, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce that name. <laughs> Okay, so just moving on to the virtual rig tour. Um, so this is gonna be a land-based rig, right? Um, just need to skip here, right? All right, so I'm just gonna let it play for a little bit. Um, and then I'm gonna identify one, two of the key components that we would have touched on. Okay. 
if anybody can identify which rig this is, I'll please let me know. I do know it's a well services rig. And that's one of the local uh, providers of, um, of rigs in, in the country. So probably gonna stop right here, all right? Um, so well services rig four, thanks Mark. So that's the name of, of, of this rig here. All right, just to give you an idea of uh, and, and to orient folks on, on the rig. So definitely this is your, your Derek, your top drive. It's not actually on top here. It, so it must be at the bottom here making a connection, all right? Um, you're gonna see different different cabins here, right? Uh, these house your different personnel. So when drilling, you do have people who are monitoring the various sensors, um, and those are called uh, mud loggers. You do have um, mud men who see about the mud system. You do have cementers on board, and they are more or less housed in, in these cabins here, right? These here would be your mud pits and your mud pump. So again, um, you take uh, fluid from here pumped into these mud pumps. Most of the times these mud pumps are reciprocated mud pumps. Um, it goes through, there are a bunch of hoses and it goes through the top drive and it's screwed onto your uh, drill pipe and it uh, pumps it down the hole through your beach and comes back out. Um, these here are what I spoke about. These are your, your shakers that help clean, clean the mud system. Um, this yellow uh, piece of equipment here, most likely that is your cement unit. Um, and again, uh, that, that's what you use to, to pump cement down your well, well bore. How it's done, you install what you call a cement head um, on, on the rig floor and you attach hoses and you, know, you basically pump cement um, via that to cement your, your, your case in, in place. Um, this here is most likely the driller's shack. That's where the driller is housed. I'm gonna show you, uh, you know, what a typical driller shack looks like inside the inside of a drill shaft looks like. And the one of the most important uh, parts of a drilling rig, and it's not actually shown, it wouldn't be shown here, would be below your rig floor, and that would be your BOP or your blowout preventer. Um, so that, that is your last line of defense if you do take what you call a kick, uh, which is basically an uncontrolled flow of, uh, it could be either uh, high pressure water, it could be hydrocarbons. Um, basically what your BOP does, it has the ability to cut your pipe and seal off your well bore. Um, again, after 2010, when you had that explosion um, in, you know, the Gulf of Mexico, a lot of scrutiny went into BOP and BOP testing. Um, I've actually been present where we have tested uh, BOPs um, and I've seen firsthand where they are able to cut, cut pipe. Um, the BOPs are tested um, every, and the requirement for Trinidad is every 14 years. So you, there are certain pressure tests that needs to get done. Um, uh, and certain requirements that need to be met before you could actually um, proceed. Um, this here is just a, a pit. Um, if you have any, uh, I guess, runoff, you know, it, it does go here. Um, you're gonna see that it is lined uh, with a polythene type material. And one key thing to note is that before any uh, drilling activities do take place, you do need to apply to the EMA for a certifi certificate of environmental compliance. That is a regulatory requirement. And during the drilling, um, the drilling process, right, um, there are tests that that are done so that um, you, you know, you do know if you are within whatever the EMA requires you to be. All right, so I'm just gonna finish off this video and just touch on a, on a few topics uh, before we open up um, for, for questions. Okay, so this is basically uh, the well services rig for, um, yeah. All right. Um, so that's actually all I had. So there's a couple of things I wanted to touch on uh, before I move on to questions, right? So you would all know that now um, we are under, you know, COVID-19 restrictions. Um, so the oil industry is being affected by it. Uh, so whenever 
that can be PTT. Before anybody goes offshore, we do uh, have to quarantine them for about 14 days uh, to ensure that there's no, um, you know, nobody is displaying any symptoms um, before they are sent offshore. Um, offshore drilling, uh, any drilling is, is, is a very um, expensive operation. Um, like a typical rig would cost between 100 to 120,000 US per day. Um, so if you do have people who are offshore who show signs of, um, of you know, of having COVID, be, besides the health aspect of it, it is pretty expensive. Recently in the Gulf of Mexico, there were a couple of cases and we had to suspend operations um, when, you know, we had to suspend operations and, and gum is different types of rigs. So we're talking probably close to 700,000 US a day that you'd have to suspend operations for. Um, whenever, you know, Whenever that happens and there was an incident, you'd have to shut down, you'd have to decontaminate, and you'd have to um, start contact tracing. So the industry is being affected, uh, definitely on a uh, health-wise, uh, as well as a cost. But the biggest um, thing is that the demand for oil and gas has has dropped significantly. Um, I think oil. I mean, you guys would have seen oil went to negative recently. And if you're in the oil industry long enough, you would see that the oil prices, it's, it's, it's cyclic. So you'll always have a time when it's pretty high, then it'll be low, high, and low. And in this time, it's definitely low, all right? Um, in terms of the future of, uh, of, of drilling and drilling operations, um, I do know that there is a lot of technology that's being trialed. Um, I would have mentioned in Telepipe. Recently, uh, people have been working, um, and I know there was a trial in Alaska where they were doing automated rig floors such that you didn't need much people on the rig floor itself. Um, so that kind of takes away uh, you know, humans from actually getting involved and getting hurt, right? Um, so, so lots and lots of um, you know, breaking new technology that, that's occurring. Um, also, you find that different operators, what they, they've been setting up, what you call like remote centers to monitor wells. So you do have um, a certain amount of monitoring occurring at the well site, but people have been setting up um, centers around the world. So I could be sitting in, um, in, in, in Trinidad and monitoring a well in Guyana or somewhere else and able to use sometimes predictive software to understand if there are any, um, any upcoming issues. So the oil field is uh, definitely um, evolving and, and, and moving with the times when it comes to te technology. All right, um, I think that's it for me there. I, I think we have about a five minutes for, for any, any questions, right? So if anybody wants to come, come off mute, you could go ahead um, and I will just quickly read through some of the questions that were posted here. Hi, Neil. Um, so we collected a couple of questions beforehand from the, right. from the attendees. Mm -hmm. So I'll just like, go through some of them with you now. Okay. Um, so firstly, what was your most challenging drilling or rig experience thus far? And right. how did you overcome that challenge? Um, so when I now got into drilling, my first while I worked with a, a senior engineer, I was a junior engineer, and um, it was on a platform called Mahogany. Um, I remember it well, very, very well, actually. It's called MB11. Um, anything that could have gone wrong in that well went wrong. So we had, we stuck our BHA while drilling, which is never a good day. We had what you call lost circulation. So if you lose circulation, um, you basically lose your hydrostat hydrostatic column. So there's a potential for influx and taking a kick. So all that happened, um, we, I think we stuck the BHA more, more than once. Um, and the sad part is that the budget, I think, for that well was about 20 million, and we spent close to 48 million, and we still did not reach the intended target. So it was a dry, a dry hole. Um, that was one of the most, if not the most challenging well I've ever worked on. But the good thing about it is that, you know, when operations go smoothly, you don't actually get an opportunity to to, to learn as much as you know when things go wrong. So it was a good learning experience, but it was a very expensive learning experience. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I think you covered some of the other questions that our attendees asked, specifically mm -hmm. concerning how rig operations have changed with respect to the pandemic. Right. Um, one of the other questions 
what type of bottom hole assembly is the most popular offshore Trinidad and Tobago? Right, so I think I would have mentioned this. So rotary steerable, definitely, right? Where you have a tool at the bottom of the hole, above the bed that steers you where you're going. Um, and the most uh, widely used tools in the, well, in Trinidad that I'm, I know of in my 14 years of experience would have been uh, gamma resistivity and then the neutron. So those are the main components of, um, of the BHAs that, that would, be, would be utilized. Um, there, there's one question I want to speak on here. So again, it was from Professor Grant. Um, so the question was, uh, can you give your thoughts as to what the future of drilling will be? Drilling is a huge cost and it is, all right? Um, I, I, I know some wells that have reached close to 100 million US, right? Um, what new technologies are you seeing being developed? So I kind of touch on that, but um, you, would, you, you, you would see, um, and this is, you know, because I am employed with BP, that we are moving uh, to what you call reinvent BP, and we are looking um, at investing into uh, you know green, green technology, renewable energies, right? So we, I mean, oil and gas is finite. Um, uh, we do also understand the implications when it comes to, to climate and climate change, right? So. I would say within the next couple of years, I mean, and, and it started now that you would see a lot more of the oil companies transitioning from not being an oil company, but being an energy company, right? And that's transitioning into solar, into wind, um, I, you know, definitely going into to green and renewable energy. Great, thank you. Um, but also with respect to, um, again, rig operations changing, how, mm -hmm. how do you see the introduction of machine learning chain, making changes with respect to monitoring specifically and data collection? Right. So uh, recently I held, um, there was an energy conference, uh, sorry, an energy showcase um, in, 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 in work in, in BP. And um, the majority of, uh, of the uh, presenters, they, they use with like artificial intelligence and they use with like machine learning. So yes that's the way we are um, heading towards um, more and more you do see um, ai coming into play um, I, I i do know that there are a lot like a lot of the oil companies are investing in startup companies to help understand you know how we could integrate um you know the, these these ai uh companies into into the oil industry um so so it it, it is starting um I'm not thinking about any specific example right now, but definitely um, artificial intelligence and machine learning is being integrated a lot into the seismic development too. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, if anyone else has questions, feel free to send them in, in the Q&A. Um, firstly, is the conductor casing size dependent on production tubing size desired? Um, yes, I know. So, you're, so, so, so you're right. Uh, so you do start one way to, to design a well is to design it from the bottom up. All right. Um, so depending on what size tubing you, you want to run, it kind of helps build, um, on, you know, what size casing you need, to, um, you need to have conductors. Um, so for pat platforms, it depends on the size of the slots that they're go going to be driven on. Uh, sometimes it depends on the size of the wellheads that the wellheads need to sit on. Um, so yes, there is, um, so, so yes, it can be determined by the size of your production string, but there are also other factors that play into the size of the conductor. Great. Um, secondly, in your opinion, what's the most common cause of a failed cementation? Hmm. Um, so, so, my, so, so in that one, and that, that, that one's a bit difficult because the amount of QAQC and rigor that goes into, um, into, into cementing. Um, I, I, I would say sometimes it's, it's a mixing because if you're ever on a cement unit when they mix cement, right? Um, so you add different chemicals like retarders, accelerators, um, and it's actually done uh, manually. So you have your silos um, with your cement, it's coming in and you do have your operator who is actually mixing um, these things on the fly. 
Um, so I would say probably, you know, during that actual operation, because you are, you are depending on a, on a human, human to get the, the, the mix correct um, to pump down the hole. Um, I mean, if I, have, if I had to venture, I would say that is the operation where you would have um, most errors. I've actually seen one time where there was a mix up and before the cement could actually come out the casing and come on the outside, it flashed set. And that was an operator error where the chemicals was mixed uh, improperly. So we spent a long while drilling, drilling cement. And the next question, um, you said the regulations state that you must test the BOP every 14 days. Yep. Do you shut down drilling to test the BOP? So no, you try to you try to nest it during an an an, an operation. Um, so so actually, so let me back up. Um, so you need to do it in fourteen days. Um, if you are doing an operation where you have to shut down, you will shut down to test it because it's a safety critical piece of equipment. However, there are certain times when you could do it offline. Great, thank you. Um, I see we have a question in the chat. Do you have any tips or motivation for young professionals who just joined the oil and gas industry? Um, so I'm going to put it like this, right? So when I got into drilling engineering, I had no idea, no clue whatsoever what it was about. Um, I, I, I joined because it, drilling engineering sounded cool. And that, that's, the, that's, that's me being completely honest. But it is one of the most dynamic um, feel that you'll ever be in. Um, what, what, what I personally like about it is that no two wells are the same. So although you have your principles, your, your basic principle and your foundation landed for each well, it's never the same. So it's, you always get to do something new and exciting. And especially with the advancement of technology. I mean, I think one time I read that the, um, and this, this could be a couple of years ago, right, that the oil industry was second to the space industry when it came to technology. I mean, some things that uh, th that you would never believe you would find it in the oil industry. I, I remember the first time I landed on a rig, I, I, I never thought that man could build this big junk of iron to, to, to be out here, um, you know, drilling these, these deep type of wells. So definitely um, what, what I would say is that the oil industry it's dynamic. It's fun. You, 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 you meet some really, really good people. And at the end of the day, what you do actually matters, right? Yes, we're moving to green and renewable energy, but we're not there as yet. So whatever you do counts right now. Great. Thank you. Um, we have one last question that was sent in previously. Um, they'd like to know about the factors that influence drilling mud performance. Um, Factors that influence drilling mud performance. All right, so you would have seen that there were different um, different types of, uh, of of mud, water based and oil based. Um, so factors that you would look look at, you know, when designing your mud, definitely um, what type of system, water based mud. Um, sometimes, if you're drilling, it causes the formation to swell. Um, oil based sometimes gives you a slicker hole. You need to understand um, also what's the carrying capacity of of your um, of your drilling mud um, you need to look at things like your sun content um, so so all these uh, you know these kind of help influence um, the performance of of your mud system um, sometimes even even the ability to cool uh, I mean we've drilled We've drilled wells before where we get to so deep that sometimes drilling mud is so hot that you need to install what you call coolers. So I mean, it's it, it's it's a lot of um, it's a lot of factors um, that that kind of influence the performance. Mm -hmm. We have another question here, um, over comment. With respect to where the future of drilling lies, I see a future in drilling operations for carbon capture and storage. That is the drilling of CO two injection wells. Mm -hmm. um, can you share your view on that? Um, to, to, to be, and I'll be frank, uh, 
I have limited I have limited information on um, on on CO two injection. I think it's something that's uh, that's now starting in the industry. Um, I haven't been privy to um, to any experience or, or or knowledge on that as yet. But um, I mean, I could do some research and, and, and get back to you, and you could post it. But I I don't have uh, much information on that right now. Great, thank you. We'll definitely share that with, with everyone. Yeah, yeah. No, um, I mean, it'd, it'd be good for me to, to understand that too. Yeah. Well, I'm not seeing any further questions right now, but if anyone has any other questions, you can always email them to us. Oh, I just got one more. But um, anything else that you have, any other questions, you can email them to us after the presentation and we will forward them to Neil. Um, the question that just came in, is there a future for petroleum engineers now graduating? I would say yes, but the job scope that you may be doing now in the next 10 years might be different. Mm -hmm. So yes, I, I think, um, like I said, we are transitioning to renewable energy, but at, currently right now, um, uh, we, we do need oil and gas. So there will be a need for petro petroleum um, engineers. However, that's not to say that uh, in the next couple of years, as you know, the world changes, that your job scope will will remain the same. It will change. Okay, well, if we have no more questions, thank you so much, Neil. That was a very enlightening and engaging <laughs> presentation. Um, I think I can speak for all of us when you said that we really enjoyed it, and it was really nice to see to get a technical perspective and get a better understanding of drill and engineering. Okay. All um, right. Um, well, this recording will be available after for anyone who may have missed parts of it. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here and joining us for this talk. And we hope to see you for our next event. Stay tuned. Keep watching our social media. And we'll let you know when is our next event. All right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.